Welcome back! We're talking again about Goethe's Faust, and we'll be looking at four scenes in which Mephistopheles arranges a meeting, and Faust finally gets to hang out with Gretchen. Run away! The first scene we look at is the neighbor's house, which opens at uh, the house of Frau Martha Schwertlein. And she is moaning and groaning over the fact that her husband has been missing for a very, very long time. She wonders if he's dead, she presumes he's dead, but she can't remarry or move on with her life until she has actual confirmation. God pardon my husband if he can, he's done ill by me, dear man, left for the wide world just like that, and left me a grass widow on the mat. Yet never did I grieve him or oppose, but loved him tenderly, God knows. For all I know he's dead, oh grief, had I at least the coroner's brief. But she's interrupted by Gretchen, who comes in to show off the new set of jewels she got. As you remember in the last episode, Mephistopheles was going to find her a new set of jewels, and now she has them. And instead of putting them on at home, or showing them to her mother like she did last time, she decides to take them over to the neighbor's house to show them off. Because last time her mother took them away and gave them to the church. But as Gretchen is trying on her jewelry, there's a knock at the door. It's Mephistopheles, who's come to deliver a special message. At first, he pretends to mistake Gretchen for an elegant lady and tries to excuse himself, but they brush that off. But Marta is very eager to hear the message that he has to bring, and so he reports that her husband is dead. Marta has mixed feelings about this. Of course, she's heartbroken over her dead husband, maybe. But she is also glad that she has the final confirmation that he's dead so that she can move on. Mephistopheles takes advantage of this conversation to continue his flattery of Gretchen, saying, Well, you're a lovely young thing. You will surely have a man here soon, won't you? Maybe a husband, maybe a lover. Gretchen says, that's not the custom with us, sir. No, no, we don't do inappropriate things like that. Mephistopheles describes the deathbed scene of Erschwart line and cracks jokes about what a jerk he was at the end, and uh, perhaps eases Marta's sentiments about the whole event. And the scene closes with Marta asking him to provide confirmation, provide witness testimony that her husband is dead so that she can be free in court. And it requires two witnesses, and so Mephistopheles says, yo, yes, I have a friend, I'll take him along, and we can do a double date afterward. This scene provides opportunity for Mephistopheles to put Gretchen and Faust together. He's organized this meeting where they're going to go to the court and then take a walk afterwards, and it'll allow Gretchen and Faust to be together for a little while. It's also the first scene that we get to see Marta in, who is a comic character. She sort of plays the same role as the nurse in Romeo and Juliet. She's the go-between between between the young woman and the young man, and she helps to put them together. Mephistopheles is keeping her off guard and uh, sort of diluting her chaperoning duties so that Gretchen and Faust can have their little time together. But the most enjoyable part of this scene is the interplay between Marta and Mephistopheles. Both of them are fairly comic characters, and there's a lot of humor in this scene. There's a whole lot of irony in the way the characters act and the things that they say. Marta's big shows of grief are really only show, because as we see, she keeps returning to two ideas. One, freedom from her marriage, and two, what her husband left her. Although she bewails his fate, it's really pretty hollow. And Mephistopheles, as we've already seen many times in the play, has a very delightful sarcasm, where he takes a very serious situation and makes it comical. And he does that in this scene through a series of reversals. He'll set up Marta's expectations and her emotions in one direction, and then he'll reverse it and say something the opposite way. This is obvious from his very first announcement of the news. He says, I wish I had more cheerful news. Please not to blame it on your guest. Your husband's dead, and since his best. That quick reversal from, your husband's dead. And sends his best. It's really very funny. He goes from being very tragic and sad to very light and casual in three words. And he's going to continue in this vein throughout his whole description of the deathbed scene. He'll say something really emotional and sad that strikes Marta's heart with pity for her husband. And then he'll immediately undermine that pity by showing what a jerk her husband really was. For example, as he describes the dying man lying in misery, he says the man's final words, which were, Alas, with what self-hate it fills me, thus to forsake my calling, thus my wife. Ah, it's this conscience that kills me, had I but her forgiveness in this life. As though the man's dying words were, oh, if only my wife would forgive me. 
Oh, I loved her so. And Marta, of course, is like, Oh, poor man, I forgive him, of course I do. And then Mephistopheles finishes the man's words by saying, but she, God knows, was more to blame than I. As though the man were seeking forgiveness from his wife, but then all of a sudden he's like, but really, she's the one entirely to blame. And so, just in the moment when Marta was feeling all this pity for him, it's reversed and she feels angry that he blamed her. And Mephistopheles sets up this big long story about how the man risked his life to win her this great treasure and she feels sentimental for him again. And then he describes how the man blew it all on women and partying, and she's angry at him again. Emotional roller coaster. Not only that, but Mephistopheles is acting all flirtatious the whole time to throw her off guard, but when we get to the end of the scene, he's beginning to get a little nervous about being entrapped by her himself. He says in an aside, I'd best be off before this gets absurd. She'll hold the very devil to his word. The irony of the devil being entrapped by the overeager woman is pretty comical. In the next scene, the street scene, Mephistopheles goes to tell Faust the good news, how he's arranged a meeting between them all, how it's all gonna work out beautifully. But there's a catch. Faust has to testify in court that he saw Erschwartlang die, which he didn't. Mephistopheles says, but first we're asked, no bother. And Faust eagerly agrees to it before he even hears it. Done, yes, let's do it. But once Mephistopheles tells him that he has to lie in court, Faust is completely horrified. If that's the best you know, the deal is off. It's over. Faust is so absolute. And Mephistopheles thinks this is funny. He says, Psh, what's wrong with lying in court? I mean, you lie all the time, Faust. Hey, remember how when you used to be a teacher and you used to describe God and man and all these big, vague ideas that you really didn't know the answer to? You really didn't know what they meant, and yet you taught like you did? It's the same thing. Faust calls Mephistopheles a liar and a sophist, someone who just likes to argue for the sake of arguing. And Mephistopheles says, Psh, Takes one to no one, buddy. What about you? Tomorrow night when you're holding Gretchen in your arms and you're saying, I love you forever. Are you really going to mean that? Tomorrow won't you try in honorable guise to pull the wool about poor Gretchen's eyes and pledge her soul love as you go? And Faust says, yes I am, and I'm gonna do it sincerely. Mephistopheles mocks his sincerity and says, then deathless faith and love, a generous surge about that single all-powering urge. Will that be so sincerely done as well? And Faust is going to argue here his definition of truth. What is truth? And he certainly has a unique definition of truth because Mephistopheles has a point. Faust's statements to Gretchen about how eternal and deathless his love is uh, are a little bit suspect. But Faust believes they're true, and here's why. He says, for when I feel all blinded and for that well, that teeming wealth, search for a name and cannot find it, then through the world all my senses casting, for most sublime expression grasping, and call this blaze that leaves me breathless, eternal, infinite, yes, deathless. Is that a trick of devilish stealth? His definition of truth is something that he feels deeply to his very core. And when he feels something that is inexpressible in words, it must be true. It has to be sincere. So if it feels true, it's true, according to Faust. Is that a problem? If something feels true, does that really make it true? And if you define truth by your feelings, you're gonna have some issues, as we will see. But Mephistopheles isn't buying it. He goes, <laughs> I'm still right. And finally, Faust gives in because what can you do? Mephistopheles is just gonna keep arguing and being sarcastic and annoying. That brings us to the garden scene in which we finally see Faust and Gretchen together. I like the way this scene is set up. It looks very visually interesting on the stage. You have two pairs of couples who are rotating around the stage. My arms don't go that way. You have two pairs of couples who are rotating around the stage. And as one is in the front, the other one is in the back. And the one in the front will be having a conversation. What, then they shift and the one in the back moves to the front and they have a conversation. So in the audience, you feel kind of like you're sitting on a park bench in a park listening to these couples as they walk past you. And they keep making their rounds around and around the garden or the park, and you only hear parts of the conversation. Only when the conversation is close to you do you actually overhear it. It's very voyeuristic. And the first couple that we listen to is Gretchen and Faust. And Gretchen is talking about how kind of self-conscious she feels here with Faust. He's really cool and fancy and well-traveled and from faraway places and exotic, and she's just plain little old Gretchen who's spent her whole life working really hard in her own home. And in the very first couple of seconds, he kisses her hand, and she feels really weird about her hands because they're all like rough from washing dishes and stuff. No, oh, don't, how can you kiss my hand? You shouldn't. It is so coarse, so rough to touch. 
the work I've been set to, would or wouldn't, my mother asked so much. And we alternate between these conversations between Gretchen and Faust, with a conversation between Marta and Mephistopheles. There's a parallel between the two, both are having similar conversations, but one is very comic, and the other one is a bit more romantic. The comedy between Marta and Mephistopheles comes from the fact that Marta is dropping hints as hard as she can that she really wants Mephistopheles. Surely you must be so lonely in all your travels, don't you just want to come home to a woman? Like, you know, if you only had a woman, the perfect woman, I'm sure. And Mephistopheles purposefully misunderstands her hints and says, Oh yes, if only, if only I could find a woman who, to, who would really love me. Oh, it's so difficult to find one. Meanwhile, Gretchen and Faust continue on in their conversation. And Gretchen feels awkward because she doesn't have anything big to talk about. I mean, she hasn't had much life experience. And so she really has no interesting conversation to share, she thinks. But Faust is perfectly delighted with her her domesticity and her simplicity. And so she describes her home and her life up to this point. And we learn a lot about her family and a lot more about her. Part of the problem for Gretchen is that her family is not very emotionally invested in her. Her father is dead, her brother is off soldiering all the time, and her mother, the only references to her mother we see are her mother ha having a watchful eye over her or making her work all the time. She spends a good while describing her relationship with her little sister, who is now dead. I brought her up and how she loved me too. She wasn't born yet when we lost our father. We'd all but given up my mother, so weakly did she lie. And she got well but slowly by and by. She could not dream, such was her plight, herself to nurse the little mite. And so I reared it all alone, with milk and water. Thus it grew my own, and in my arms and on my lap it, kicks, it kicked its legs, turned cheerful, and grew up. But with it came many long hours of hardship, too. At night the little one would sleep beside my bed. It uttered hardly a peep, and I was up. I'd lay it down beside me, get it fed. Or if it didn't stop, get out of bed and jog it on my shoulder, on and off. Then at first light, standing by the laundering trough. Then mind the stove, then do the marketing. And so day in, day out, the same old thing. It's hard at times to keep in cheerful mood, but rest tastes sweeter then, and so does food. This story about her sister reveals a lot about her. She is, after all, only 14 or 15 years old now, and so her care for her sister must have been in very early teen years or even before. And her mother was very disconnected after the baby was born, partially because perhaps she was ill from complications, but also because her husband had just died. She may have been depressed. In any case, the entire burden of caring for the household fell on Gretchen's shoulders, and she took care of everything, including her little sister. She's already had the experience of being the head of the household, the caretaker, the mother figure. And she's experienced great grief and loss, losing her father, losing her little sister, the loneliness and disconnect from her mother and brother. And we even see that there's some tension between her and her mother because her mother seems to have held back the money that their father left them. They could be living more comfortably, but her mother carefully watches it all and makes Gretchen do all the work and take care of everything instead. There are a couple of questions to pose here. One, if if Gretchen has had such grief and difficulty in the past, has it matured her and made her stronger and made her more ready to deal with the problems of the world? We often talk about grief and loss forcing us to grow up. There's a poem I really love by Edna St. Vincent Millay called Childhood is a Kingdom Where Nobody Dies. And it's about that exact aspect, how childishness and innocence and naivety comes with not experiencing grief and loss. It's only once we've experienced grief that we really have to grow up. We have to step into the adult world. The realization of death and what it means is part of being an adult. The poem goes like this. Childhood is not from birth to a certain age, and at a certain age the child has grown and puts away childish things. Childhood is the kingdom where nobody dies. Nobody that matters, that is. Distant relatives, of course, die, whom one has never seen or has seen for an hour and they gave one candy in a pink and green striped bag or a jackknife and went away and cannot really be said to have lived at all. And cats die. They lie on the floor and lash their tails and their reticent fur is suddenly all in motion with fleas that one never knew were there, polished and brown, knowing all there is to know, trekking off into the living world. You fetch a shoebox, but it's much too small because she won't curl up now. So you find a bigger box and bury her in the yard and weep. But you do not wake up a month from then, two months, a year from then, two years, in the middle of the night and weep with your knuckles in your mouth and say, oh God, oh God. Childhood is the kingdom where nobody dies that matters. Mothers and fathers don't die. And if you have said, for heaven's sake, must you always be kissing a person? Or, I do wish to gracious you'd stop tapping on the window with your thimble. 
Tomorrow, or even the day after tomorrow, if you're busy having fun, is plenty of time to say, I'm sorry, mother. To be grown up is to sit at a table with people who have died, who neither listen nor speak, who do not drink their tea, though they always said tea was such a comfort. Run down to the cellar and bring up the last jar of raspberries. They are not tempted. Flatter them. Ask them what it was they said exactly that time to the bishop or to the overseer or to Mrs. Mason. They are not taken in. Shout at them! Get red in the face! Rise! Drag them up out of their chairs by their stiff shoulders and shake them and yell at them! They are not startled. They are not even embarrassed. They slide back into their chairs. Your tea is cold now. You drink it standing up and leave the house. In this poem, she describes that turning point between childhood and being grown. And she says it doesn't have a specific age. It's not like all these years are childhood and all these years are adulthood and there's just that one age. Once you hit 18, you're an adult now. But childhood is instead not knowing death. And according to the poem, there are certain kinds of death that don't count, right? There are the distant relatives that die. You may see death, but not really understand it, not really feel it, because it didn't affect you. And even the deaths that do make you cry, like the cat, still doesn't change your life so that months from then, years from then, you wake up in bitter grief in the night because the grief overwhelms you and wakes you. I think part of the power of this poem is the way that it focuses on very specific aspects. For example, in the stanza where it says, and if you have always said, for heaven's sake, must you always be kissing a person? Or, I do wish to gracious you'd stop tapping on the window with your thimble. The fact that those are such specific statements to say really draws out their potency. Kind of like when your mother or father shows you that sort of annoying affection in public and you're just like, oh, come on. It's very easy to get annoyed at very simple and unimportant things in people you love and to express those annoyances without really fully meaning to. But as the poem points out, tomorrow, or even the day after tomorrow, if you're busy having fun, is plenty of time to say, I'm sorry, mother. Those people you love will always be there for you. They'll always be around to apologize to later. And so if you make a mistake, there's always tomorrow. Until one day there isn't. And when that begins to sink in, it really has an effect. When the day comes when that person is no longer with us, we tend to ask ourselves, why was the last thing I said something annoying? Instead of, I love you. Why did I care about my mom giving me that hug in public? Or why did I care about those silly little comments she was saying? Or that little tapping she was doing? Why did I blow up about that? That wasn't important. I should have been spending that time telling her or him how much I love them. And Malay defines being grown up as sitting at a table with people who have died. I don't think this image is literal, but she describes it as if it were literal. You're sitting surrounded by people who have died and they don't ever respond to you. I think this has to do with the fact that once we've experienced grief and loss, those people are still always with us, and we keep wanting them to come back. We call them back. There's really all the stages of grief in this last section of the poem. At first, you try to pretend like it didn't happen. You try to still talk to that person. There's all the things you still want to say. They neither listen nor speak. They do not drink their tea, though they always said tea was such a comfort. And if you try to tempt them to come back, if you try to lure them back in, they can't. They're gone. And even if you get angry at them and you shout and you yell and you try to get them to in some way come back because of your anger, it still doesn't work. They still can't return. Until finally, you have to accept it. And you have to accept that your life is different now. Your tea is cold now. You drink it standing up and leave the house. It's a very sad conclusion, but it is a moving on. And the tea, which used to be such a comfort, is no longer very comforting. We can never go back to that childish innocence, that naivety, that inexperience with death, but we can move on. How has Gretchen reacted to the grief and loss in her life? Well, we could say that it made her more mature in the fact that she had to take on a whole lot of adult responsibility. And perhaps it did make her stronger for future griefs. But at the same time, the grief that she experienced losing her little sister, who she reared, is not going to emotionally prepare her for Faust. Faust is a different experience. And in some ways, the emotional void in her life, the fact that her mother doesn't seem to be emotionally invested in her, her father is dead, her brother is gone, her little sister is dead, all of that has left her unprepared for this person who is now showing her affection. It's almost as if this first man to flirt with her and show her affection completely wins her heart over. And although she may have gained some maturity and gained some experience through the, the time she spent as the head of the household and through the time she spent raising her little sister, 
she still is very much a child. We see this even more clearly when shortly after that, Gretchen picks a flower and begins to play the he loves me, he loves me not game to determine whether or not Faust really loves her. And her sweetness and her childish innocence is really played up here. And when the answer of the flower is he loves me, Faust gets all excited and says, Yes, child, let this flower word be godly oracle to you. He loves you. Ah, know you what that means. He loves you. And he goes on and says, Let this gaze, this pressure of my hands, express to you what is ineffable, to give one's whole self and to feel an ecstasy that must endure forever. Forever! For its end would be despair. No, without end. No end. I love you forever. And Gretchen runs away. Which jumps us to the next scene, which is really a continuation of this scene, the garden pavilion scene. And Gretchen runs into the garden pavilion, and Faust runs up and grabs her. But all that emotional language is sort of, again, pushed to the side as he calls her a little scamp and a little tease, and then he kisses her. He's only known her for like, what, an hour? And what does she say in reply? Dearest man, I love you with all my heart. <sighs> so her emotions have let her just fully give herself to him within just a couple minutes of their meeting. Mephistopheles pops in and interrupts them and draws Faust away. It's time to leave. And Gretchen, left all alone, says, I wonder what he sees in me. Oh, it's so wonderful to be in love with him, but I wonder what he sees in me. And that draws us to the end of this episode. Next time, we see what happens when Faust runs away. He's got to think things through before he continues his relationship with Gretchen. And we'll see how Faust is thinking of her while he's away and how she is thinking of him. The Disney song for this particular episode is Once Upon a Dream. I know you, you hit on me once upon the street. I know you, I crept in your room and I have seen where you sleep.